<laughs> We're almost ready. I'm waiting for my thumbs up. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Welcome everyone. This is our closing session for the day. However, the conversation continues tomorrow online and on campus uh, with more information on the symposium main webpage. I wanna thank all of the speakers and participants in this extraordinary event. Uh, and I will single out Diane Burko, whose vision led to the creation of this symposium, uh, as well as the heroic staff work by Sarah Leary, Chelsea Anderson, Dylan Singleton, Erica Fortwangler, Haley Jardis, uh, Rebecca Basu, and so many others. Uh, and uh, for the brilliant technical support from Eric Gordon uh, that keeps us streaming online uh, to our audience in the virtual space. We wanted with this symposium to find a way to see climate change in more than statistics, in ways that can move people to understanding and to action. And I have been moved many times over during this weekend. We are ending today with a bang. Debbie Lockwood is the ideas editor for Rest of World, a news site dedicated to technology stories from beyond North America and Europe. And she's a former editor and writer at the New York Times opinion section. But that's not what makes her extraordinary. For her new book published by Simon & Schuster, A Thousand and One Voices on Climate Change, she spent five years traveling through 20 countries on six continents, much of it by bicycle, to carry out 1,001 interviews through deep listening to people facing flood, fire, drought, and displacement. Water becomes the linking theme here, humanity's amniotic fluid that we all need to develop and to live from day to day but so many told Devi what it did to them and to their families and communities when they suddenly had too little or too much. They also confided in her about their hopes and fears and frustrations, perhaps especially the rural women not used to having their opinions taken seriously by a stranger with a tape recorder and a microphone. We have heard a lot about intersectionality this weekend and I was struck in reading Devi's captivating book by how often men told her, mansplaining, what was wrong with her ideas or her project or her travel plans, although some of them then gave her reflective gear to try to keep her safe. I travel not only for myself, Debbie writes, but for all the women who are unable to do so. School of Communications students in the audience will be interested to know that she completed a graduate program in science writing at MIT in 2019 and she studied folklore at Harvard, a writer's writer with an inspiration to young people everywhere who wonder whether to follow their dreams and their devotions. She has published her thoughts and everything from the Washington Post and the Guardian and the Times to Poetry Quarterlies and Bicycling Magazine. And she was a youth delegate to COP22 held in Marrakesh, Morocco in 2016. Please join me in welcoming the Scheherazade of the Anthropocene, <laughs> Devi Lockwood. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, thank you all for being here and for that epic introduction. <laughs> um, so it all started with a cardboard sign and a marathon. In 2013, I was living in Boston during the marathon bombing and the city was put on lockdown. So when that lifted, all I wanted to do was go outside to walk and breathe and hear the sounds of other people. I craved face-to-face -face connection, looking at fellow human beings without flinching. I needed to connect to remind myself that not everyone is murderous. So in a fit of inspiration, I cut open a broccoli box that was under the sink and wrote open call for stories in Sharpie. I wore the cardboard sign around my neck and people stared at me when I went outside. <laughs> Some approached me, open call for stories, they asked. What does that mean? Do you have a story to share? 
And would it be okay if I make an audio recording? On that first day, I heard all sorts of things. I met homeless Vietnam vets, a woman wearing a Lady Liberty costume and holding a sandwich board advertising parking told me that she lost everyone on her block to the earthquake in Haiti. I met a transit police officer who swore that his mother was dead for 48 hours and came back to life after he asked to have just one more cup of coffee with her. When I listen, the whole world widens. And once I started listening to strangers and having conversations like these, I really didn't want to stop. I brought the cardboard sign with me everywhere. After a while, I felt kind of naked without it. So that summer, I rode my bicycle down the Mississippi River, 800 miles, on a mission to listen to any stories that people had to share. I brought that cardboard sign with me. And one story was so sticky that I couldn't stop thinking about it for months afterwards. I met 57-year-old Franny, 80 miles south of New Orleans. When I stopped in front of her office to check the air pressure in my tires, she invited me in to get out of the afternoon sun. Franny shared her lunch of fried shrimp with me. In between bites, she told me about Hurricane Isaac in 2012, which washed away her home and her neighborhood. We fight for the protection of our levees. We fight for our marsh every time we have a hurricane, she told me. But despite that, she and her husband moved back to their plot of land, living in a mobile home just a few months after the storm. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else, she told me. Do you think there will come a time when people can't live here anymore, I asked? I think so. Not in my lifetime, but you'll probably see it. To imagine the road I had been biking on underwater was chilling. 20 miles ahead, I could see where the ocean lapped over the road at high tide, water on road, an orange side red. Locals jokingly recur refer to the end point of State Highway 23 as the end of the world. So here was this one front line of climate change and one story. What would it mean, I wondered, to put this in dialogue with stories from other parts of the world, from other front lines of climate change with super localized impacts? My goal, once I graduated, became to listen to stories of water and climate change and to amplify the voices of those most impacted. Why water? Water is a substance that we can see and feel. When water is not present in our lives during a drought, we experience its lack acutely and water is rationed. In the most dire cases, our throats go dry. When water is present in overabundance in a flood or in cases of sea level rise, it becomes a force for destruction, washing away homes and businesses and lives. So many, but certainly not all, of the impacts of climate change are experienced through water. And it's almost always easier to talk about water than it is to talk about climate change. Why? Because water is something that we can feel. I also set out to address another problem that I saw. The language that we use to discuss climate change is often abstract and inaccessible. We hear about feet of sea level rise or degrees of temperature change or parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But what does that really mean for people's everyday lives? I wasn't sure, but I wanted to find out. And storytelling can be a way to bridge this divide. I also find that traveling primarily on my bicycle was a great way to connect with people in the places between places that might not otherwise be considered as important. So one of the first stops on my journey was Tuvalu. It's a low-lying coral atoll nation in the South Pacific that's on track to become uninhabitable due to both food and water insecurity that's intensified by climate change in my lifetime. For some context, the country is 585 miles south of the equator and home to around 10,000 people. So when I was there in 2014, I met meteorologist Tawala Katsia. He opened up his computer screen to show me an image of a recent flood where water bubbled up under the ground near where we were sitting. This is what climate change looks like, he said. But the first signs of change had emerged about a decade and a half before. In 2000, Tuvaluans living in the outer islands noticed that their taro and pulaka crops were suffering, he told me. The root crop seemed rotten and the size was getting smaller and smaller. Taro and pulaka, two starchy staples of Tuvaluan cuisine are grown in pits dug underground. This crop failure was the first indication that something was wrong. Tawala and his team traveled to the outer islands to take samples of the soil. After a period of research, the culprit was found to be saltwater intrusion linked to sea level rise. 
Since 1993, a tide gauge at the main wharf has taken regular measurements. The seas have been rising at four millimeters per year since that monitoring started. While this might sound like a small amount, this change has dramatic impacts on Tuvaluan's access to drinking water. Because again, remember, the highest point is only 13 feet above sea level here. So a lot has changed in the last 20 years. Thatched roofs and freshwater wells are a thing of the past. Those wells have become salty, so they're repurposed as trash heaps. All of the water for washing, cooking, and drinking comes from the rain. The freshwater lens, a layer of groundwater that floats above denser saltwater, has become both salty and contaminated. And each home has a water tank that's attached to a corrugated iron roof by a gutter. This rainwater is boiled for drinking and also used to wash clothes, dishes, for bathing. But during periods of drought in Tuvalu, families have to make really tough decisions about how to allocate that water. And one woman, Angelina, who's a mother of three from Funafuti, was really honest with me about the impacts. She's at the far right, right there. If there's no water, we worry a lot, she told me. During the last drought, her middle daughter, Siulai, was only a few months old. Angelina told me that she, her husband, and the oldest daughter could swim in the sea to wash themselves in their clothes. We only saved water to drink and cook, she said. But what about her baby? The newborn skin was too delicate. If she went into the salt water, she would get this horrible rash. How can a mother decide between having water to drink and water to bathe her child? So the stories I heard about water and climate change in Tuvalu also had this interesting division across generational lines. Tuvaluans my age, like Angelina and her family, they don't see their future on the islands. They're applying for what's called the Pacific Access Category Visa to enter a lottery to live in New Zealand. And older Tuvaluans, in contrast, they see climate change as an act of God. They told me that they couldn't imagine living anywhere else, and they didn't want to leave the bones of their ancestors, which are buried in the front yard in Beach Home. Some things just cannot be moved. My time in Tuvalu showed me how climate change exacerbates both food and water insecurity. And then that insecurity drives migration to other parts of the world. And this theme was echoed in other places too. In Thailand, I met a modern dancer named Soon who had moved to Bangkok from the rural north. And he moved to the city to find work because unpredictable rain patterns had made rice farming his family's occupation for generations more unstable. There's no more work because of the weather, he told me. So migration to the city, in other words, is hastened by the rain. I also heard stories about climate-driven food and water insecurity in the Arctic. Iglulik, Nunavut is 14,000 miles south, or excuse me, 1,400 miles <laughs> south of the North Pole. And it's a community about, of about a little less than 2,000 people. Life in the North is really expensive because fruits and vegetables are flown in. A two pound bag of grapes can cost more than 20 Canadian dollars. Marie Irut, a 71 year old elder lives by the water. We spoke in her living room over cups of black tea. My husband died recently, she told me, but when he was alive, they went hunting together in every season following the migration patterns of different animals. This was their main source of food. I'm not going to tell you what I don't know. I'm going to tell you only the things that I have seen, she said. In the 1970s and 80s, the seal holes would open in late June, an ideal time for hunting baby seals. But now if I try to go out hunting at the end of June, the holes are very big and the ice is really thin, Marie told me. The ice is melting too fast. It doesn't melt from the top, it melts from the bottom. A few years ago, Marie went seal hunting by boat and brought the animal onto the land to eat fresh seal meat with her family. The skin looked really old and it was very easy to break, she said. She blames this on increasingly warming water temperatures. Caribou hunting has also changed. Again, in the 70s and 80s, she went caribou hunting on Baffin Island in August. Back then, she told me it was very, very hot with lots and lots of mosquitoes. Now it doesn't have any mosquitoes. The water looks colder at the top, but it's melting from the bottom. The sea is getting warmer. When the water's warmer, animals change their migration patterns. 
Ogluelik has always been known for its walrus hunting, but in recent years, hunters have had trouble reaching the animals. I don't think I can reach them anymore unless you have 70 gallons of gas. They are that far now because the ice is melting so fast, Marie told me. It used to take us half a day to find walrus in the summer, but now if I go out with my boys, it would probably take us two days to get some walrus meat for the winter. Marie and her family used to make fermented walrus every year. But this year I told my sons, we're not gonna do it. They're too far, she said. I read my Bible every day and I know things will change. I believe both of them are happening now, what is written and what I see with my own eyes. So it might sound strange to think of storytelling as a climate solution, but in my five years documenting these thousand one voices on climate change in 20 countries on six continents, I learned that deep listening is something we really urgently need to confront the climate crisis. Listening is the first stop on the way to solution building. If we're building solutions that don't take into account the voices of people who will be impacted, it's dangerous and more importantly, ineffective. With an issue as complex as climate change, it's easy to fall into a kind of silence, to assume that we have nothing to add to the conversation and should therefore let others, the so-called experts speak. But more than anything, we need to be talking about climate change and amplifying the voices of others. Storytelling is an intervention into climate silence. I also wanted to do my best to diversify the notion of expertise. People are experts in their own lived experience. Climate science is crucial, of course, but by putting that science in dialogue with the stories of people who are impacted, we can begin to move forward in a way that's more creative and collaborative and ultimately I think more interesting too. So my final takeaway would be this, <laughs> get out there, ask questions and listen, um, intervene into climate silence by having conversations about the hard things. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we're, we're going to have time to take questions now from our in-person and virtual audience. Um, and so while we're uh, preparing those, uh, do we have a question already? Oh, uh, sure, yes. Okay, let's begin with a question from our virtual audience. Um, I know you learned a lot about um, different people and places and things, but what has everything that you've learned about others taught you about yourself? Um, this is on, right? Uh, that, that was a fantastic question. <laughs> um, I think one of the big changes that I noticed in myself personally was that I got a lot better at listening. <laughs> I listened back to some of those early recordings from when I was biking down the Mississippi River. And I was almost like put off by <laughs> how much I jumped in spoke over other people. I was really kind of only halfway listening or listening with the intention to respond. Um, and part of that was just nervousness, right? I was putting myself out there in a way that felt really vulnerable and I wasn't like naturally that extrovert <laughs> in, in, to begin with. So I think that, yeah, I got a lot more confident with silence and with leaning into um, letting other people direct the conversation um, and almost falling forward into the rhythm of someone else's voice, right? And, and then sometimes asking questions, but not always having a question in mind and letting the conversation take its own shape. And, you know, some of the audio recordings would be like 45 seconds long and some of them would be 45 minutes. My arm felt like it was gonna fall <laughs> holding the microphone up for that long. But I don't know, I, I, I remain so grateful that so many people took the time to speak with me because I was really figuring it out as I went <laughs> and um, yeah, definitely became a better listener the longer I did it. Debbie, I know that you've made the struggling people you met on the front lines of climate change, the principal subjects of your book. Um, and, and yet I'm sure that because you were very close in age to our own students when you began this project, they would be interested to know a little bit more about what led you to it beyond the cardboard signs and the aftermath of the marathon bombing and um, and and whether you knew that it was going to take five years and how you had the courage to go off on this adventure. Yeah, sure. So I did not know it was going to take five years. I thought it was going to be one. <laughs> <laughs> I myself this 
a desire to slow down <laughs> and thought, when else in my life am I going to have, you know, not only the generous funding and traveling by bicycle is really cheap. So the, I think the grant from Harvard was like $22,000. It just made that last like many years <laughs> um, living in a tent mostly. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I think so my senior thesis in folklore and mythology was poems that were inspired by those stories that people told me biking down the Mississippi. And the poetry didn't feel quite right, but it was really interesting to me to try to make it work. And, and I think I kind of fell sideways into a career in journalism after that because I wanted to write something that was more uh, narratively driven, longer form, potentially has a larger audience. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that there was a lot of kind of testing things out and figuring out exactly what felt best. And my original idea was to kind of make an audio map where you could click on a point and listen to a story from that place. The idea for a book didn't really happen until enough people told me like, hey, you really need to do this. I had an agent reach out to me and be like, mm, this sounds like a book. <laughs> um, so I don't know, it was kind of a process of learning to let the project take its own form. Even the number 1001 um, started out a little bit as a joke <laughs> um, with a friend. And then she's like, no, you should actually do that many recordings. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, so it was kind of a having, a general direction and the kernel of the idea, but then being open to it changing and to the form of the journey changing. And that was hard, but ultimately re a really fun creative challenge. Thank you. We have another question. Debbie, Hi there. I remember when I first met you at the Women's Museum at one of those crazy dinners. And we just got to know each other. And I said, what are you up to? And I heard about this project. And she was just speaking, I think, was it 2017 or 2018? I yeah, remember. it was early on. It was early <laughs> on. And we've been follow, I've been following her. We've been following each other. Um, my question is, you've done incredible work. Your journalism is wonderful. Your writing is great. How have you sensed the impact of what you're doing. You've been doing a lot of talking, I know, in New York and during Climate Week. Can you give us some stories about that and, and, and about impact, which is difficult to assess, but even <laughs> some anecdotes I think would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to know. I don't know if it really is for me to know, but I get very excited. Um, I mean, okay, I, I wrote this book for people who maybe understand a little bit about climate change, but feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of it and don't really know how to have an entry point into that conversation. Um, and what I really wanted to do was broaden the way that we discuss these issues to, like, like I mentioned, diversify the notions of expertise, but bring in some really specific stories that people can maybe hold on to that might feel as sticky as that first story that I heard with Franny that made me kind of not able to stop thinking about these issues and I think really changed me as a person, right? So the times, I don't know, whenever I hear from someone who I don't know who's read the book, I get kind of excited. Um, similarly, there's been a handful of people who I interviewed who have reached back out to me to say how incredible it is to have that experience reflected on a page. Um, but I don't know, my hope, <laughs> there, there was the, kind of this fun moment um, too, where I know of at least two and maybe three people who were inspired to make their own cardboard signs on different topics um, yeah. earlier on in the trip. So, um, you know, if it can get more people out there and traveling by bicycle or get more people to take on whatever epic creative project they feel like is almost too nuts of an idea to go after, <laughs> um, then that will have done something small. So that means something to me. Thank you, Wendy. I'm so happy you're here with us. And the question I have is the following. You have 1,001 voices, but there is one writer, so it's you. So can you tell us about the process of, you know, converting those voices into your writing? Yeah. And whether you have come across any kind of conflict, maybe, or any kind of, you know, anything that you can tell us about this, it would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's such a good question. <laughs> um, so I guess it might help in answering that to talk a little bit about the process of actually pitching this book to publishers. Mm -hmm. So 
the first round of submissions went out in 2016 um, and I got something like 40 rejections and the agent I was working with, Tim, who's wonderful, he's like, do you want to read them or no? And I'm like, oh my God, please. Yes. Like I want to print them out and tape them on my wall and like absorb this and become stronger. <laughs> um, and the feedback was really interesting at that point. Part of it um, was editors saying, you know, books about climate change don't sell unless you're Naomi Klein or Bill McKibben. And I think that there's like, way in which the impacts of climate change have become more intense in the intervening five years. And as such, perhaps there is more space for other voices on that subject. That's my hope at least. Um, and the second piece of feedback uh, I got was editors asking me, well, what's gonna keep someone turning the pages? Right. If you open up this book and you read one, I, I, I wanted to be like Stubbs Turtel, right? I wanted to have just edited transcriptions of my conversations with people and nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> and so the editors were saying, well, what's going to keep someone invested to turn the pages? And I did some thinking and reflecting on that and realized that, in fact, I had to insert more of myself into the story. And I was really nervous and hesitant to do that because I didn't want it to feel self-involved or self-indulgent or like I was somehow at the very worst, like using other people's stories as a form of self-actualization. Like I'd re read books like that. <laughs> <laughs> found really off-putting and I didn't want to do that. Um, but I had to find this kind of delicate balancing point where the book needed narrative sinew and the only narrative sinew was me because I was the one who had recorded all these stories. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was a process of figuring out how much of myself I felt comfortable putting on the pages, what would actually be of service to the reader. Um, and it, it just became this interesting kind of question and push and pull and tension in the, the writing and the revision process. And I'm not even sure if the balance that I landed on is the best possible way of doing it, but there was a deadline <laughs> and I needed to get it done. And it's, it, I, did, I did my best, but I'm trying to think less back on that now in a critical way and more thinking forward about how I can apply the lessons I learned in this book into the next piece of work. My sense from reading it was not self-involved, but self extraordinarily self-reflective. Um, and uh, that that's one of the special qualities of the book, I think, is that you narrate experiences of things that happen to you and you have comments on them that are that are interesting and uh, open up the aperture of the of of the lens that we're seeing this through, um, adding new new layers to the experience of the reader whom you brought along on this trip. I wonder if you could tell us a few more stories of the people that you've met. Um, perhaps uh, Tanea Tangaroa from uh, uh, working on a wetland in New Zealand, or oh, yeah, yeah. Gertrude uh, <laughs> Kabusimbi Kenyangi, the Ugandan forestry expert that you met in Morocco, or you can pick them. Sure, but, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll jump into Tanea's story because I, I love talking about it. I think that um, I mentioned it on this panel this morning, so hopefully it's not repetitive, but. <laughs> Um, Tanea is a Maori woman who is from Wanganui, New Zealand, which is a town in the North Island, which is where the Wanganui River meets the sea. And I met Tanganea, um, Tanea, excuse me, through um, a mutual friend that we had. And she has been working for something like 20 or 25 years now, diligently in a day by day way to do the hard work of restoring a wetland that had been used as a landfill site for several decades. And the landfill began at a time when landfills were unlined. So there's problems with kind of toxic leachate um, going out from the landfill into the surrounding environment. And there's also a huge amount of invasive, both plants and animals that have come and kind of gravitated to this area. So she's been hauling out those plants that are problematic, doing all sorts of things to bring back native populations of birds. And also more recently in the last decade or so has started to use this wetland as an environmental education site. So tapping into not only the spiritual connection with the land, but also teaching kids in her community about the different names and attributes of these plants and animals that should and shouldn't be there. And I was just so moved <laughs> by her story um, for a couple of reasons. Um, but the biggest one being that I think it shows, you know, how slow and steady <laughs> uh, this one solution can be. 
right? And it's it's super localized, but it's not something that happened overnight. It's not something that happened as a result of the whims of a big corporation, right? It was one person in her community taking the initiative and putting on gumboots and wading through the muck, literal muck, to um, do what she felt was really important. And um, the impacts of that have ripple effects that are wider than this place. Thank you. Should we take another question? Hi, um, I'm wondering, so you were talking about uh, the types of experts that we typically listen to. Um, and I know the climate conference right now is going on in Glasgow, COP. So I'm just curious, like what can, what do you hope people take from a book like this and from more climate storytelling to like broaden the idea of experts? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting at COP in particular because it can be such a, a like sanitized kind of white male power space. <laughs> um, and, but there's also all these civil society members who travel um, and some have access not to the negotiating rooms, but to rooms that are like kind of just out in the outer ring of that. And then some people are just on the perimeter of the conference, right? But I think for me, the function of these kind of events is to bring those civil society members together in a way that they can have conversations and also frankly like exchange protest tactics and, <laughs> and launch these really creative kind of visionary ways of disrupting the conversation and forcing their voices into that space. And so, I don't know, my hope both for COP and <laughs> for, for this book and the reception to it, I guess, is that we can not just turn to who it might be obvious to turn to, right? And and there's there's already enough oxygen that's been sucked up in any given climate conversation by the the traditional ways of thinking about expertise and power. But when we really focus first and foremost on prioritizing the voices of people who are impacted and, and giving them like the power and the emphasis that they deserve, um, that it benefits everyone. It's a hard thing to do though. <laughs> and I don't know that we're there yet or even close, but I mean, even along generational lines, right? Um, so Minish Dan Gupta, who's a really incredible writer for the New York Times climate section had a piece come out, I think today about how, you know, there's this like kind of sharp age generation and like, background divide in terms of the people who are making decisions at COP who are like mostly white male and older and then the people who are demanding that the conversation become different who are folks like Vanessa and Akate who are in their 20s and women of color from the global south and the people who are going to be living with the impacts of this first and foremost experiencing it in a more dramatic way and for like the vast majority of their lives right and so to the extent that we can amplify those voices, prioritize them. Um, I think what really moves me about the generation of youth activists who are younger than I am um, is how they've just demanded that this become a part of the conversation internationally. And that is something that just need to <laughs> keep up. Let's take another question from our virtual audience. Another question from the audience is that the climate change crisis caused millions of farmers around the world to suffer from poverty, diseases, and the COVID-19 pandemic, droughts, droughts, conflicts, and more. And what do you think is the best way to um, to solve the to solve these issues and to um, make sure we're doing, making the right solutions and the right changes? Yeah, I mean, agriculture is such a key component of how people experience the impacts of climate. Um, I think that any solution, it's such a good question, right? I, I don't know, but I think that any solution will have to be hyper-localized, right? And we'll have to, like, in a way, we should be asking those farmers what needs to be done rather than relying on someone coming in from the outside. Yeah, but um, it's it's a, a big question <laughs> and one that I think we're gonna be having to focus on for, for a long time. As you were conducting your interviews, as you were meeting so many people, 
did they sometimes offer you suggestions that you should take back to the United States? This is what we want you to tell uh, President Obama or you know whatever, whatever. Did they have a message for you about this is what we need, this is what should change? Hmm. Yeah, let's, so, I mean, the one example you that's coming to mind is about yeah. water use, and I don't know if this is quite an answer to your question, but it's an adjacent answer. Maybe it'll take us to an interesting place. But when I was living in Tuvalu, right, um, the water that we did have was really um, precious and had to be treated as such. And I would, you know, staying with a, a host family for the majority of my time there, and trying to be a gracious ho or a gracious guest, I would offer to do things like washing the dishes. And um, I just got flat out told like, yeah, white people don't know how to do that without wasting a ton of water. <laughs> like, like, please don't. Um, or I wanted to do my laundry uh, one time and uh, the family I was staying with was like, well, we have to wait for it to rain. There's not enough water to wash your clothes right now. So I, I think that that attitude about preserving <laughs> and maintaining and, and, and really treating water as the most precious substance and there's not enough of it to go around um, was something that I carried with me. Um, but it's less of a like policy answer. I'm not sure that uh, there's nothing that's coming to mind that was quite that direct, but it, it would be an interesting question to pose. It's one I wish I could ask to some of the people who I spoke with. This is the same family who asked you what it was like at Christmas on your island. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 They're wonderful. Uh, it, it was just the assumption that everyone lives on an island. Um, <laughs> it was really fun. Trying to describe snow is a very <coughs> substance. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the reasons that stayed with me and seemed so poignant is that, in a sense, that's the problem: is that we're all on our islands. Yeah. Ooh. And good one. <laughs> and uh, and and the amount of empathy contained in that observation by them, you must also be on an island faced with the problems that we have on this island, mm -hmm. with the sea rising and, and the like, also seemed like a departure point for a kind of universal connection. Yeah. And maybe the problem is that we don't realize that we're all on islands. Yeah, <laughs> we but think of course, we're somehow safe. Yeah, you know? of course, like the impacts are experienced really disproportionately, mm -hmm. right? And this is where like principles of environmental justice come in because for me, like my race and my education level and my class and my passport, all of these things insulate me from the worst effects. And if something terrible were to happen here, like chances are I would be fine. Um, and that's not the case for the vast majority of people who are experiencing these impacts firsthand. So I think it's important to think about that applying that environmental justice lens to understanding the layers of oppression structurally that already exist both here in the US and abroad um, and then just making sure to keep that in mind when we have any conversation about policing. That's an example of the kind of self-reflection that I was referring to before which is that Devi had all of that extraordinary privilege that she's just described and decided to use it to take herself to places that you can't go without that privilege mm -hmm. in order to examine it and to, uh, to, to try to do something instructive with it. Um, the, the, and, and, and I point that out because a lot of the students who are watching online have also said to me and to other faculty that as they become aware of their extraordinary level of privilege, uh, especially if they get interested in international affairs and, and think of the, the contrast between their lives and the lives of so many people around the planet, then they say, okay, now what do I do with this? Uh, and I think your story is an example of that you can find your own way. Uh, to, to Hope so, something. yeah. <laughs> can you tell us about Aidai Turdakunova, a 16-year-old student in Kyrgyzstan who wanted to be a, uh, an environmental engineer? Yeah, sure. Uh, I met Adai at a place called Chicken Star um, <laughs> in Bishkek, which is kind of the like cool happening spot for, um, it's like a coffee shop, but they also have chicken. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, she she attended an event, like a, a little talk that I gave there and was really um, passionate about studying water engineering, um, addressing the problems of kind of 
involves the infrastructure and the long tail impacts of kind of Soviet central planning on water supplies that didn't always take into account how um, water might move through a landscape or through concrete um, and to apply that to the future. So I, I should honestly, it's reminding me I should check in with her because she is probably in the university now and wow. hopefully studying towards that future. But um, yeah, I was really moved of the time that I spent in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan speaking with younger people there about, um, they were just very, uh, on the whole, if I can make a generalization, like problem solvers, <laughs> eager to um, address the ills that they saw around them if it had to do with infrastructure or something else in a very direct and concentrated way. Yeah. Do we have a question from the audience? A question from the audience. Can you talk about the artists that you've met along your travels and how art contributed to climate action across your experiences and across your journey? Yeah. Um, because it's COP now and I'm thinking back to the COP five years ago, I'm going to talk about that and then I'll see if another one comes to mind. Um, but I, so I was there with a US youth delegation from a group called Sustain Us, which if any of the young folks listening um, are interested in going to one of these climate conferences in the future, um, Sustain Us is an incredible organization where you can apply to join one of these delegations and um, kind of connect with like-minded folks from across the country and then around the world in this negotiation space. It was incredible. Um, so a lot of the people, I was there kind of as a journalist or a budding journalist, I guess, um, and the majority of the people in the delegation were organizers. And so we were there. It just so happened that um, COP22 happened um, in the middle of the first couple of days was the, the 2016 US presidential election. And so we had a firm idea of what the outcome was going to be, which was not the outcome that happened, <laughs> but um, went to bed. Uh, there were some people who stayed up all night watching that little needle on the New York Times tracker and getting more and more stressed out. And the plan had been to make um, a presidential to-do list for President Clinton, which was going to include things like respecting indigenous sovereignty and getting to zero by 2050 and honoring treaties and um, protecting water in more direct ways. And um, there was this list of like probably 15 items <laughs> that um, had been we, we didn't have paintbrushes with us. So someone sacrificed their toothbrush to the cause <laughs> and then eventually realized that that wasn't that efficient. So then they started finger painting. This was all happening on the roof of this place in Marrakesh where we were staying. And soon there was the call to prayer and it was dawn and it was abundantly clear that Trump had won the election. And so we were all awake at that point. <laughs> I'm like, well, what do we do? We have this presidential to-do list. Obviously it's not gonna be a good way to show up at this international space with this list that's so out of tune with what this president elect is likely to do. Um, so someone had the idea of crossing out the presidential and making it the people's to-do list. And so finger painting commenced <laughs> bright red paint. And we unrolled this sheet um, inside the UN and outside the UN. And then it made a trip in the US to different climate action sites that people who were organizers in the group were involved with. And it became this kind of like really beautiful visual flashpoint in a way. Um, and I think the art of that <laughs> sheet, <laughs> the finger painting, um, even though it was words, it kind of allowed uh, the activists among the group to consolidate among a cause and to remind others that it's not just about people in power that there's a lot that we can still do so that i think was one example of art being a powerful medium for <laughs> addressing the current current moment there's a lot you can do with paint and your fingers in a sheet Vivian, marrakesh is where you met a ugandan forestry expert yeah yeah do you want to tell us a little bit about her um yeah, yeah, I think it was Gertrude, right? Gertrude Kabusimbi Kenyangi. Yeah, so I think I, I'm, I'm blanking a little bit on all the specifics of our conversation, but what I remember most was that she was, I think, I think it was identifying like changes in rainfall patterns in her community, but also trying to preserve resilient seeds within that group and distribute them within the women who were 
doing farming and um, finding ways of finding more climate resilient crops that would help um, these women and their families to face the changes that they were seeing in their in their lived environment. But I should I should reread that section. It's been a little while since I thought thought about her. She was wonderful though. Is it an, another aspect of the democratization of expertise or uh, redefining um, where, where expertise lies. Um, are there other questions? We have a question from our in-person audience, okay. and then we'll go to the virtual group. Um, how hard was it building trust with people so they would open up to you in these conversations? Yeah, um, I think, I think the cardboard sign really helped because it was kind of goofy and a little disarming, right? Um, so that was a good conversation starter. It wasn't like I was walking up to someone and being like, so climate change. <laughs> um, they were kind of coming to me or the cardboard sign was an invitation for them to come to me. Um, I think that frankly being like a five foot five white woman in her early twenties also helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, because pretty much no one considers me intimidating. Uh, and also, people were really eager to help. Um, I spoke with some solo male cyclists, especially in Australia. There's just these vast distances between places. Um, and I remember meeting this one guy who's like <laughs> really wonderful, petite, hilarious Italian man who like, <laughs> There's so many different ways to do a bike trip. He would stop every 20 kilometers and roll and smoke a like little cigarette and then keep going. <laughs> and, um, he's just like brilliant guy. But I was chatting with him. I'm like, well, don't don't people take you in all the time? And he's like, what? No, like no one ever takes me. And I spend every night in this little tent that I bought at the Australian equivalent of Walmart that has stars and moons on the ceiling. It's like, oh, um, people would take me in all the time. Um, and so I think that 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 just like the present like it doesn't. I, there's spaces that I don't have access to. Like I wasn't a swashbuckling male travel writer who's gonna go have six pints at the pub and <laughs> chat with the locals, right? That would be a situation in which I would feel very vulnerable. But people were inviting me into their kitchen tables all the time to have these really intimate conversations. I think that I worked a lot, I was speaking earlier about listening to the question about how I changed, right? Um, I worked a lot in thinking about my body language and how that could communicate that I was really eager to listen to someone. And so that came from not breaking eye contact, like not in a creepy way, but just in a like nodding along <laughs> in a way and, and leaning forward and being fully present and removing any distractions that might exist in the space, like digitally or otherwise, to the best of my ability. Um, and also I, tried to make a habit of always thanking people for their stories um because every story is a gift right and i really firmly believe that everyone has something to teach me if only i am open to it <laughs> take the time to listen or to be in that experience fully and so i think that keeping that that mindset at the forefront was was really important So we have another question from the virtual group. Um, have you kept up with any of the individuals whose stories you've gathered and have you connected or introduced any of the individuals you spoke to with others on the project? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, I think one of the like really challenging and really beautiful things about that kind of like fast track to intimacy through doing a audio like oral project like this is that I made a lot of friends with a lot of people really quickly and then had to say goodbye to them and that sucked. <laughs> but um, one of the amazing things about you know the internet and social media is that um, a lot of people are on Facebook <laughs> all over the world. Um, it's how I still stay in touch with Angelina in Tuvalu. She messes oh, wow. me every couple months and um, asks me if I've like gotten married. <laughs> <laughs> she's like she calls me sis she's like sis when are you gonna settle down <laughs> i still have no news for you um but um you know it's it's been really beautiful to be able to follow each other's lives longitudinally like that and similarly made some really incredible friends in new zealand um and kept, kept up with them there's a lot of really like interesting climate organizing happening there so yeah, and then introducing people to each other. Um, 
there's a group in New Zealand of anti-fracking activists in Taranaki, which is a region that has a lot of fracking in it. And I went to a, a kind of gathering of those activists really early on in my time there and met some people in Leeds in the UK several years later who were working on really similar issues. So kind of did a cross pollination <laughs> introduction, which was really fun. Um, and there's been a handful of other times where it's also made sense to introduce people to each other. Um, but yeah, those, those moments always make me really happy because it just feels so random and serendipitous. Debbie, since I've been talking about your book in the last couple of days, people often say, 20 countries, Asia, Central Asia, Latin America. How did she talk to people? Right. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and of course, in Peru, you could use Spanish. Right, speak Spanish. Yeah. And in, in Morocco, I suppose you could use Arabic, although you were mostly well, mixing with top people. Eat, eat, like there, there's different dialects for each country, and they're all very different from each other. And the Arabic that I learned in college is modern standard Arabic, which makes me sound like I'm speaking Shakespearean English, and it's really embarrassing. So <laughs> it's like the language of the BBC. <laughs> Like it's not, it wasn't all that useful, but um, in other places. Um, so it was a combination of things. Um, for the couple of weeks that I was in China and traveling, I worked with a um, kind of recent graduate from a college there who had been studying English and she was able to give me kind of really rough translations or kind of broker introductions with people who we met on the street, which was really fun. Um, <laughs> in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, I was traveling there by invitation of the US consulate general and they furnished me with a translator and a videographer and a driver. So it was like me and these three dudes and she would totally change the, the like vibe of the journey, but it was really fun and kind of frustrating, but it's a super interesting like translation challenge. Um, and then when I was in Thailand, um, so I had a friend of a friend who worked for television broadcast there and she did a tiny segment for like Thai TV and then helped me translate the cardboard sign from English into Thai, which I would wear around. But then, of course, people would want to know what it was about. So then she also translated a couple paragraphs that I wrote out about who I was and what I was doing and why I was doing it. But then some people weren't literate. So I used like a combination of body language and the Google Translate like text to voice <laughs> option, which was um, very rough <laughs> to say the least. But what was interesting about making audio recordings of those moments was that I then um, was able to come back home and a couple of years later have them translated. So I gave a talk at a high school in New Hampshire that had a Thai exchange student by chance in the audience. And he was really eager to translate those audio recordings for me as for some, his summer internship. Um, and then there's also this great website called Fiverr where people like any language you can think of, people will um, transcribe and translate for you. Um, so I used that for some of the late stage audio recordings, which is really exciting because there were a handful of things where I had no idea what was <laughs> being said to me, but had a very strong memory. Like there was this one time in Thailand, rural Thailand, I like rounded a corner of a dirt road and there were a bunch of people dancing around a tree with these like tall bamboo instruments. And there was all these pieces of fabric around the tree and like a little spirit shrine by this rice paddy and kind of got the vibe it was a harvest ceremony or maybe something about a spirit to do with the rice, but I didn't exactly know what was happening. <laughs> and the translation later on, um, I mean, first of all, they like <laughs> kind of waved me over to dance with them and it felt like like several hours we were just circling this tree. It got really kind of a huge date. Uh, and then afterwards we ate sticky rice and someone told me the story. And the story ended up being about um, which is the, the spirit related to this particular time of year um, and the rice, but also the, the storyteller was expressing that they didn't know how much longer people would be celebrating this because so many people were migrating away from that area because of the unpredictable rainfall pattern. So it was a climate story and I kind of got the gist of it, but it was so magical to be able to return to that <laughs> later on. Um, so yeah, it was a, a mixture of many methods <laughs> Um, kind of mostly improvisational, but somehow it all worked out. We have another question, virtual audience. 
Yeah, this is the last question we have from the audience. Um, you mentioned absorbing negative feedback to become stronger, like a stronger writer and a stronger person. Can you talk more about how um, that developed into courage and helped you grow through tougher times in your writing and in your just different ventures? Yeah, I don't know. I'd imagine it's probably similar for anyone who creates anything, right? It's, it's just taking the lessons from the last thing and applying it to the next thing and always wanting to create more. <laughs> and uh, so my hope is to just continue doing stuff because I like, love listening, love doing interviews, love. writing, <laughs> uh, love editing, even when it's pain. <laughs> but um, looking at it as there's no one fixed endpoint, right? It's an iterative process. There's always something else to do next. And um, having that forward thinking mindset rather than just ruminating too much on the last thing um, has really helped. Like I wrote a ton of crap poetry <laughs> in high school, right? But like, it helps you get to the next place, right? <laughs> so there's, there's a, you know, everyone has to have a shitty first draft and then we just move forward from there. Well, Debbie Lockwood, yeah. <laughs> Scheherazade told a thousand and one stories to save her own life from a brutal king, mm -hmm. but nonetheless could not escape the compelling need to listen to her. May your thousand and one stories help buy us the time we need to work the problem and to have the opportunity to read more of your writing. <laughs> it is impossible not to be captivated by it. Uh, we will be surprised by the dawn reading this story again and again. Uh, so thank you for being with us and thank you for being so open about your writing process and your experiences um, and uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to have this beautiful book. I want to say thank you too to the audience, to those of you who have made it here in person, to the virtual audience. Um, and uh, this concludes the streaming program for today. The, those who are in person are invited to go downstairs to, or upstairs to uh, room 111, collaboration room in the Hall of Science for a dessert reception where Debbie will be signing books. And uh, for those who'd like to read A Thousand and One Voices on Climate Change. And I encourage everyone to log in tomorrow um, for uh, to hear from a, a virtual artist talk with AU faculty member James Mayhew who will be discussing climate change in artwork at 10 a.m. on Sunday. There are details on the symposium website and you can see uh, join using the same web link that you used today. Thanks again to everyone. Thanks to Debbie. Thank you.